Spoon River Anthology. The following poems are selections from the Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters, written and published in 1915. Each of these poems is a character, and this is their epitaph at their gravestone. They're all fictional. Here is Deacon Taylor. Deacon Taylor, I belong to the church and to the party of prohibition, and the villagers thought I died of eating watermelon. In truth, I had cirrhosis of the liver, for every noon for thirty years I slipped behind the prescription partition in Trainer's Drug Store and poured a generous drink from the bottle marked Spiritus Frumenti. And here is the epitaph, the poem of Nolte Hoheimer. Nolte Hoheimer. I was the first fruits of the Battle of Missionary Ridge when I felt the bullet enter my heart. I wished I had stayed at home and gone to jail for stealing the hogs of Curl Trenary instead of running away and joining the army. Rather a thousand times the county jail than to lie under this marble figure with wings and this granite pedestal bearing the words Propatria. What do they mean, anyway? And here is the poem, the Epitaph of George Gray. I have studied many times the marble which was chiseled for me, a boat with a furled sail at rest in a harbor. In truth, it pictures not my destination, but my life. For love was offered me, and I shrank from its disillusionment. Sorrow knocked at my door, but I was afraid. Ambition called to me, but I dreaded the chances. Yet all the while I hungered for meaning in my life. And now I know that we must lift the sail and catch the winds of destiny wherever they drive the boat. To put meaning in one's life may end in madness. But life without meaning is the torture of restlessness of restlessness and vague desire it is a boat longing for the sea and yet afraid and here is the the poem the epitaph for elsa vertman I was a peasant girl from Germany, blue-eyed, rosy, happy, and strong, and the first place I worked was at Thomas Green's. One summer's day, when she was away, he stole into the kitchen and took me right in his arms and kissed me on my throat by turning my head. Then neither of us seemed to know what happened, and I cried for what would become of me, and I cried and cried as my secret began to show. One day, Mrs. Green said she understood and would make no trouble for me, and being childless would adopt it. He had given her a farm to be still. So she hid in the house and sent out rumors as if it were going to happen to her. And they all went well, and the child was born. They were so kind to me. Later, I married Gus Vertman in years past, but... At political rallies, when sitters by thought I was crying, at the eloquence of Hamilton Green, that was not it. No, I wanted to say, that's my son. That's my son. And here is Lucinda Matlock's epitaph. I went to the dances at Chandlerville and played Snap Out at Winchester. One time we changed partners, driving home in the moonlight of middle June, and then I found Davis. We were married and lived together for seventy years, enjoying, working, raising the twelve children, eight of whom we lost, ere I had reached the age of sixty. I spun, I wove, I kept the house, I nursed the sick, I made the garden, and for holiday rambled over the fields where sang the larks, and by Spoon River gathering many a shell and many a flower and medicinal weed, shouting to the wooded hills, singing to the green valleys. At ninety-six I had lived enough, that is all, and passed to a sweet repose.
What is this I hear of sorrow and weariness, anger, discontent, and drooping hopes? Degenerate sons and daughters, life is too strong for you. It takes life to love life. And here is our last epitaph. This is Doc Hill. I went up and down the streets, here and there by day and night, through all hours of the night, caring for the poor who were sick. Do you know why? My wife hated me. My son went to the dogs, and I turned to the people and poured out my love to them. Sweet it was to see the crowds about the lawns on the day of my funeral, and hear them murmur their love and sorrow. But, oh, dear God, my soul trembled, scarcely able to hold to the railing of the new life, when I saw M. Stanton behind the oak tree at the grave, hiding herself and her grief.